بسم الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع سنته إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome again to another episode of your live weekly Islamic chat show Live by Islam I'm your host Ismail Bullock and today as you know we've been going through various themes based upon different verses from Surah Al-Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Qur'an and as well when we have the opportunity when we have guests who are new Muslims or became Muslims should we say some of them are not really new anymore but they became Muslims so they could have been previously Christians or whatever religion may be so today with us inshallah we have brother Muhammad Tim Humble Assalamu alaikum Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and thank you for joining us it's a pleasure now inshallah you'll be inshallah one of our frequent guests inshallah from time to time uh, but today specifically as it's your first time with us on the show and the fact that you at one stage were not a Muslim like myself so we wanted to give the viewers the opportunity to hear the story of why you being from the UK from the West decided to to leave what is often termed as a Western religion for what is incorrectly often termed as a Eastern religion even though we know they all came from the East so we want to hear a bit about introduce yourself first of all I've given your name and uh, a bit how you know how you started to you know look into Islam okay brilliant so as you said uh, my name is Muhammad Tim uh, I was born Timothy Michael Humble uh, I was born into a Christian family Although, like many people of many religions, and I suppose Muslims are no different, a lot of people are not really practicing. And my family were no exception to that. They were your typical English, Western, Christian family, which means that they had very little connection to Christianity. I wouldn't have known where my local church was. Uh, we went to church for weddings, funerals, um, maybe some odd you know, christening or something like that. But otherwise, we didn't really have any link between us and the church. But it, we were brought up as Christians. And most of my family were Protestant Christians. But there's a couple of interesting kind of... Uh, I always argue in my family that I wasn't the first to convert. Although I was definitely the first to convert to Islam. Uh, my mother, actually my, my, my maternal grandfather, became a Jehovah's Witness. Okay. Uh, he had a, a scary experience one time in his life. Um, some sort of you know otherworldly type experience and he decided to become a Jehovah's Witness uh, that's quite significant because it meant that my mom was brought up not celebrating Christmas and not believing in the divinity of Jesus in the way that many Christians believe in it it's kind of a 50-50 thing there. I believe that they don't also celebrate birthdays is that correct I'm not sure about the birthday, that possibly, yeah, possibly I remember true. when I was at school there was a, a, a girl and a boy who were Jehovah Witnesses and what always stood out about them, apart from the fact that in theory they weren't supposed to have girlfriends and boyfriends, is that they also wouldn't celebrate birthdays. Mm, I believe so, they, like, so they're, they're a little bit, in, in some ways they're a little bit nearer to Islam than, than some other, many other mainstream Christian groups. Also within my family, there were a couple of converts to Catholicism. Not, not, not a lot of people probably know this, but you actually do have to convert to, to change from Protestant to Catholic in Christianity. You have to go through a conversion st uh, study process, and then you have to actually make a statement of conversion or a ceremony of conversion to actually convert. So my grandmother's uh, sister, uh, she converted to become a Catholic when she got married. So I had a bit of a mixed Christian background within the family. That's very, very similar to mine because even from my side of the family, on the, on the father's side we were Protestant slash Church of England and on my mother's side Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I kind of had both those experiences. Yeah. And like yourself, there wasn't, we weren't really that religious but there was a time where um, me, me and my father and my mother at one stage were living with our grandparents and, um, and there was a time when actually my mother and father split when I was quite young. So for quite a while, me and my father lived with my grandparents. And my granddad was quite active in the church. So I, we didn't necessarily go to the church. We would always hear about it's Sunday, granddad's going to the church to assist the vicar, that kind of thing. Yeah. But I had both of those 
sides, yeah. like you said, mixed, you know, one side this and one side that. See, my mom left being a Jehovah's Witness when my grandfather died. Actually, I, to be fair to her, she probably never did become a Jehovah's Witness. She was kind of pushed into it by her father, but I don't think she ever really genuinely believed in it. But what's interesting is uh, that she did a lot of things that as a Muslim I might do now, like give lectures to people and like, you know, give little talks and uh, encourage people to do good things and tell people not to do bad things and, you know, so I guess it wasn't so strange uh, for her the kind of things that I do now are almost a reminder of, of some of the sort of you know, activities that she would do. She identifies with that. Uh, although there's still some huge, huge differences, obviously, between between the belief that they have and, and, uh, and Islam. And one of the big ones was, of course, what we would in Islam call belief in Qadr, belief in the divine decree. Uh, they have real big issues with this. And one of the things that they, uh, they have is that they don't accept, um, they don't accept blood because they believe that blood is sacred. Uh, and so they believe that if you were to treat yourself by taking on blood, you would go against God's will. Now, as Muslims, of course, we know you can't go against God's will. You can't, you know, you can't overcome the will of God. It's, it, it beats everything. It's supreme. But uh, they have that kind of understanding. You'd be going against God's will. And so that caused a lot of problems because my uh, grandfather died of uh, some kind of cancer. And... He, he was, during his treatment, he refused some treatments due to his belief. So that pushed them away from it. And in many ways, that made more of a problem for me because uh, although I think it's somewhat easier when the family is not practicing so much, but also it, there was an aversion in my house to organized religion as much as there was an aversion to, uh, to Islam. So they were quite against the whole idea of, look, we've just left that lifestyle, you know, we've we've grown up, we've left it, we've walked away, we don't want an organized religion in our life, we don't want something that tells us get up at this time and go to bed at this time and pray at this time and do this and do that, we want something that is just, you know, believe and you'll be saved, you know, like just the, the nominal belief that you tick on the box that says, you know, when, when they ask you on the census, are you Christian, you tick the box. So that, that's the kind of background to the family, that's kind of where my family was. I probably should talk a little bit about where, about me myself, um, it was a bit of a contradiction as a child. Uh, I was uh, pretty good academically. Uh, I was in the top top of my class, and you know, the sort of one of the the brighter students. But I desperately didn't want to be that person that I was, uh, and I was trying to look to be something else. So one of the things I was really, really rapidly trying to do was to shake off the idea of being in any way like intelligent or good at school or you know gifted in any way at all and to try as much as possible to get in as much trouble as was possible for me to get in at that age. You think that that's like because of peer pressure or the stigma of being a, of being intelligent you know unfortunately there are a lot of people like if you study hard they like to call you a nerd or something you know you can't like it's so unfortunately many times uncool to be to be to study and be smart. Yeah I think uh, I think Peer pressure probably formed in my own mind this concept that I don't want to be I don't want to be that person I don't want to be the person who studies so I would make every effort not to study you know and uh, things like that also I think that from my side I was a very rebellious uh, child and, and one of the things I link this in terms of how I became Muslim is I find that Islam is the first thing that I've ever been able to submit to the first thing that I've ever felt this is deserving of me saying I will take it 100% with no, no exceptions. As for everything else I've ever been told, I, I had a very, I had, I don't have now, but I had a very rebellious nature. So I love to do things, you know, if I was told to be at a certain time, I'd love to not do it. If I was told to study something, I would love not to study it. I was a very rebellious kind of uh, child. Um, but I was, living, li I, was, I was living very much a double life. I was living a life where I was going out with friends and doing some not very good things. Um, the socializing, you know, the, not a lot of drinking and stuff at that age, but some, and just generally getting myself into trouble and doing things I shouldn't be. And uh, really, the, I didn't want to be that person. That wasn't, 
that wasn't who I wanted to be. Neither did I really want to be that student who was sat there with a you know, head always in a book. I kind of wanted to be somewhere else completely, which I didn't really understand at the time. But I, I was, in other words, trying my best to be non-conformist, not to conform to anything at all, and not to sort of fit into any particular box. It actually sounds very, I mean, uh, very in some ways uh, familiar to me because before becoming Muslim I went through that stage as well of doing some other kind of things you might be like, you know, trying the smoking, trying this, trying that, just kind of like you said, you know, no real reason but ap apart from that kind of rebelling feeling or I can relate very much to not being there and not being there and could have got, you know, could have continued, could have got really good grades then, but decided to, p to play up, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's quite interesting. I think it, it's, it's probably quite a familiar story for many people, I would imagine. I, I was going to say, I think a lot of people probably go through that. A lot of young people go through that rebellious phase. And to be fair to them, sometimes it is because what they're being asked to do doesn't always make a great deal of great deal of sense and of course as a young person you're always told you're, you know your your elders always know better and you know like uh, the system's always right and I was very much of a uh, of the belief that it wasn't and until Islam came along I, I didn't find anything that I was willing to really sort of change myself for in fact everything I found I wanted to just do the opposite uh, whereas when Islam came along that that's when re things really changed but I mean, I wasn't particularly interested in religion. I mean, w the time we're talking about now is probably uh, the me at least the, the memories that I have, the strong memories I have, to in about year eight, which would be 12 years old, maybe 11 years old, going to 12 years old, something like that. So around about 12 years old, getting into a lot of trouble, messing around, just generally being mischievous, nothing really serious, but also I could see where it was going. Um, some of the friends I was associating with were within a couple of years they'd be doing really seriously bad things you know like serious crimes and stuff like that at this age they weren't but they you could see where it was going and mm -hmm. and I could see where it was going and it wasn't it wasn't going anywhere anywhere very good uh, so that was something that I wasn't particularly interested in religion at that time although I do always remember believing in God I, I really do believe that. I don't think that that's a, a memory that I've kind of imposed in myself. I kind of, I really do think that I remember, for example, when I wanted something for a present, when I, when I got myself in a real fix, yeah, and there's can, no way out. Oh yeah. God, please! I, God, please help yeah, now me. Now you're yeah? saying that I can, I can relate. I can remember things like that as well as a child. They'd always do that. Oh God, please! You know that kind of thing. And I, I really did believe that there is a God, uh, but. I just wouldn't have been able to answer any more than that. If someone had said, who is he, what does he do, what religion, I would have probably said all religions are just there to manipulate people and control the masses and you know there's no benefit in organized religion and that's probably the kind of thing I would have ended up saying. Uh, but I did believe there was a God um, and I don't think I had closed my mind. I wasn't like a person who would say I don't believe, I, there is no religion that is true in the world. I would more likely have said I haven't found it yet. Like uh, I don't think I closed my mind to that extent that I would have said like, you know, there's nothing true about any of them. But I felt like that based on what I had read, and I love to read. I love to read a lot. Um, in fact, my mother always tells me that when uh, I was young, when I was a small child, I used to I used to dislike having the TV on. I used to I used to cry to have the TV switched off and give me a book, um, and I used to love to read. And of course, when you read, you're introduced to a lot of stuff, you know, good and bad. But a lot of stuff that I was introduced to was probably, probably through reading that I began to be introduced to religion. That and during the time when I was in that year, that eighth year eight or eighth grade, whatever they call it, uh, that was where I probably first was exposed to religions other than Christianity. Um, because in the religious education lessons we had in year eight, he had a very energetic and a very likable teacher. Um, he was a guy, his name was Mike, and he was, he was a very, 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 very friendly, very nice guy. And very, um, uh, he also, you couldn't put him in a box of anything, you know, like, I, I, until now I have no idea what religion he, he even was, you know, like, he 
had a long ponytail and he wore funny cowboy boots and he just used to make everybody laugh in the class. But the interesting thing about him was he actually opened my eyes that there are religions elsewhere in the world other than Christianity. I don't remember him teaching us Islam, although I presume that he probably touched upon it somewhere. Uh, but I don't remember ever hearing anything about Islam. But I do remember seeing Hinduism, Sikhism, mm -hmm. Judaism probably, and thinking, okay, there are other places in the world where people think differently to me. Uh, that was probably something that in, in hindsight, like looking back on it now, had a pretty big impact on me because it made me start to think that, okay, maybe the answer doesn't lie within my the four walls of my house maybe there are people elsewhere in the world who might be able to answer the questions that i personally have and i think that combined with reading probably started off the process or at least nudged it further forward and i think the next major thing that happened was that i changed school uh, i changed from uh, i don't know not, they don't have this all over the uk but in, in uh, newcastle where i was there was a three-tier school system, so um, primary, middle, and then high school. So I changed from year eight and year nine to a new school. Uh, whereas a lot of them now they change it at year seven. Uh, whereas I changed it, I changed it year nine. So I went to mm -hmm. a, I went to a um, to a different school, and that gave me a, a, something different because it gave me a chance to break away from the negative cycle that I was in. Probably being grounded for large periods of time helped uh, because I probably was by that time grounded to the nth degree. <laughs> it's actually funny now to say grounded. It's such it's such a great thing because now you cannot gr you can't ground your children anymore, can you? Because yeah. they don't hardly leave the house and the <laughs> Xbox all the time or something. Yeah. So grounding them is like you have to literally take the Xbox and yeah. hide it somewhere or I something. I think switching Cut the, the Wi-Fi. Modem. Yeah, yeah. I do that a lot. You know, confiscate the modem. <laughs> that so, usually, that's the modern day grounding yeah that's it uh, so I think being grounded a lot probably helped uh, I didn't get rid of the problems but it definitely made me think look the friends I'm with are there was no there was no friendship there was no friendship every not 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 among any of them it wasn't like they weren't friends with me they, none of them were friends with each other every one of them looked for an opportunity to take advantage of the other person uh, it was all about me uh, like about about saving yourself and getting somebody else in trouble or blaming somebody else or somebody else is not cool as long as you get to be saved from whatever these guys are planning to do then that was fine so that was one thing that I noticed uh, was a chance to break and a chance to look for something different and I probably spent my year nine time most of it pretty much secluded in other words, I kind of pretty much drew into myself a little bit. I didn't have anywhere near as many friends. Um, I didn't go out anywhere near as much, although I still continued doing a few silly things from time to time. Um, but it wasn't, like, it wasn't like it was before. It had calmed down a bit. And I, I think the new school, the environment, that's a little bit scary for you. You know, you're kind of trying to find your feet. So it was a time of a lot of self uh, reflection and, I, and I'll be honest I still wasn't looking for a religion you know if anyone had said to me that you know for example if someone stopped me in the street and said would you be interested in Islam can I would you inter be interested in me telling you about Islam I would have said no way not interested don't want to know not interested in religion and walked away um, probably because I didn't know what Islam was at the time but Really, I wasn't, I, I don't, you know, people often have stories where they become Muslim, where they're looking for a religion and then they find Islam. I, I wasn't looking for a religion. I might have been looking for answers as to why, like, why am I here? But I didn't really want anyone to tell me those answers. I just wanted to figure them out by myself. So there I am in that year, you know, so I've turned 13, um, probably heading towards 14. Probably while I'm 13 is usually that that's the time when I spend most of my time on my own, probably. And then moving towards being 14 and at this point I really started to um, I started to we, we had a, a religious education classes which continue we have a, obviously a totally different teacher uh, she was a lady and uh, she was very uh, I mean she was not in favor of Islam at all uh, and she wasn't to be fair really very much in favor of Christianity either 
Um, I heard religiously, although I've never been able to confirm this, that she was uh, sort of one of these sort of um, modern kind of influenced by Buddhism, sort of like karma and reincarnation and a bit of Hinduism and some kind of strange stuff like that, like in there. She had some sort of like funny, sort of very far, far Eastern religious... Uh, mystical kind of thing. Yeah, m mystical kind of beliefs and stuff. Really. So definitely there, there was that there. But she didn't talk about her beliefs very much and I haven't been able to confirm that, uh, whether that was the case. That's what we understood from her. But she was factually very true. You know, she, she kept it as it was. Um, and I remember that something really, I mean the process was just the strangest thing. Uh, I believe in the national curriculum at that time we had to do either, we had to do Christianity, that was mainstream syllabus, no choice. And along with Christianity we had to do one other major world religion. And I believe the choice was probably between Judaism and Islam. Because ultimately, you know, for, for someone teaching kids in the UK, at that time, the resources were not there to teach another religion, you know. So, realistically, if you're going to teach Christianity, you're probably going to teach with it either Judaism or Islam. Teacher chose Islam. I, I don't know whether that was forced upon her, whether she wanted to teach it, whether she chose it, but we got Christianity and Islam. And I just remember, uh, the first thing that I remember doing was talking about concept of God. Like, who's God? And of course, she talked about what Christ most Christians believe. Not all Christians, but m the majority of Christians believe in the Trinity. They believe that, that God has three forms or three parts. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and in w some forms or another, they explain what that means. And that, for me, was never, I never believed in that. Because it's the most... It's just incomprehensible. You can't, you can't understand it. You can't. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't matter how many times you try and explain water, ice, and steam, and whatever. And there are lots of sort of worldly examples. The egg, the or shell, the, egg, the, the yolk, shell, the, the, yolk white. and the white. <laughs> but you know, like bits of the egg don't die, like separate to each other. And bits of the egg don't, you know, like don't, you know, one bit doesn't end up praying to the other bit. I mean, it like it. It's a nice example of how you can have three things in one box, but it's not a very good example of the Trinity. Because the Trinity is about God, it's not about an egg, it's not about cooking about your the breakfast. Of everything. It's about telling you that God is actually not one, but He is one. And this is where Christianity gets complicated, because at least Trinitarian Christianity, because you end up starting to talk about, okay, God is one, but He's not one. Okay, so when you say, okay, God is one, say, yes, if you don't believe God is one, you can't be a Christian. Okay, I believe God is one. But you also have to believe that He is three. And if you don't believe He's three, you also can't be a Christian. So that's very difficult for people to explain. And most Christians will suffice themselves by saying it's just a matter of faith. It's just a matter of belief. There's no way you can understand it. There's no way you can comprehend it. There's no way you can ever explain it to anybody. You just got to believe it to be saved. And that was exactly the type of thing that I didn't believe in. Uh, I didn't believe in anything I couldn't understand. I didn't believe in anything that couldn't be explained with simple, clear, you know, easy to understand language. Uh, I, I wanted something clear and simple. So I got that Christianity and then I got the concept of God in Islam. I mean, that's it. I mean what you're saying again, uh, which probably most people actually who are from a Christian background have become Muslim, exactly the same thing that just, you know, I believe there was a God, but this whole Trinity just, you know, wouldn't resonate on me. I couldn't work it out. It just didn't make sense, you know. There was something there that just didn't make sense. I always had this thing like, you know, how can God have a son? And, you know, whereas, as, as, you, as you're probably going to mention, we know that in Islam, it's the opposite. I mean, just like if you try to go to the Christian to ask them to explain the Trinity, it's something they can't really explain. Each one will try and explain it in a different way, or like you said, they pretty much put it down to blind faith. Whereas, obviously, us as Muslims, of course, there is an element of blind faith. The fact that you know God will not appear to you. Uh, we have to believe that there's heaven and hell. We may never see these things, but if you ask us to talk about our fundamental belief on how God is one and what affirms that or what negates that we can have episodes and episodes and episodes telling you on how God is one and if you do such and such then you are going against this oneness of God in his worship for example 
we can talk about it for weeks and years. There's a big difference there, where and that I mean that if you if you think about it, that has to be the case. I mean, for any of our viewers out there who may be thinking, if you, the fundamental belief that is your salvation is what will save you, make you of the chosen people of God, it has to be something that you know makes the average, as they say, Tom, Dick, and Harry can comprehend and understand. Yeah. As as a as a basic belief, it has to be quite straightforward and make sense. Otherwise. It would be unfair if it's some really complicated thing that most people just can't make sense of it and then you just have to believe it anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And then it has more problems because historically you ask, okay, how did Jesus explain the Trinity? To which point a Christian says, uh, Jesus didn't. Uh, and some of them say Jesus didn't even know that he was part of a Trinity. So there's a, there's a huge, just huge pile of problems with it. And then you get Islam. One God never born, never had any offspring, or children, sons or daughters, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-merciful, all-loving. It's like, wow. That was like, it's just wow. I mean, like, it's just, it's so simple, it's so easy to understand, and it's not blind faith, because there are so many signs to that. You know, for example, we're told in the Qur'an that if there were more than one God that had created the earth, the earth would have become corrupted. Because when you have two people working on the same project with the same amount of authority, they would, you get clashes, Clash. you get contradictions. And likewise, you get another thing, okay, if they're not the same authority, then it would be the case that all of those other gods would seek intercession with Allah, and as we're told in the Quran, they would they would all be the ones you know seeking nearness to Allah. So ultimately, you know, you Islam just, it has many many proofs and many signs for it, and those proofs and those evidences and those signs that we see in the world, along with our natural inclination to believe in God, along with Scripture and prophethood and miracles, all of them come together to prove conclusively that Islam is the truth. So, and I mean, we'll get to that in a, in a bit in more detail, but just the concept of God. But when I heard that concept of God, I didn't just jump up and say, hey, I'm going to become Muslim now. I just thought, wow, just proves to me that some people somewhere else in the world could have been right about something. I mean, what's interesting is, I often say if people were to look with an open mind, and they are really sincerely looking for the truth, and they come across this concept of God in Islam. A lot of time, if not all the time, that alone is enough to seal the deal, as they say. I remember myself seeing some Muslims praying at my school, 14 years old, going home, and let me read a bit more. Again, I had religious education, as you mentioned, but it wasn't in great detail. So I remember going home, and my granddad had this, you know, in the UK, we have the Regis Digest publications, and there was a big book he had called The World Book of Facts. So I went over to the, to the bit about religion, and I remember, like you, like you said, which also struck you is reading about the different religions. Of course, every religion has some good concepts, and but then it ke again it struck me as well. Muslims believe the same kind. Of, you know, God is one, nothing like Him. He has no partners, no children. He is the ultimate Creator. There's no inter you don't have to pray to somebody else to go to Him. And that just struck me. And, I, and even at that young age, like yourself, I said to myself, "Wow, you know, that sounds that sounds like God." Yeah. Everything else when I read it doesn't sound God or it sounds like a half God or, a, a, you know, it doesn't sound like the, old, the almighty, the all powerful creator of everything. In fact, it sounds very much like the kind of concept of, of pagan gods that exist in things like Roman, Roman and Greek mythology. And Greek mythology. Yeah. You know, there was a guy who had a fight with another guy. The whole and, you know, clash of the yeah, titans and stuff. Uh, exactly. It's, it's literally humanizing God and really what I you know what we understand now is that really what what happened is that Christianity compromised with paganism in order to appeal to the pagan people and to get them to accept Christianity Christianity became a, a pagan religion it became paganism it, it adopted things that were never taught by Jesus never taught by his disciples and were simply just introduced for the benefit of getting 
pagan people to accept it as I mean, their religion. Now is a very relevant time. Uh, now we're going through Easter. I mean, the whole Easter bunnies, the Easter eggs. This is all something they had in their in the uh, Easter was a was a, a, a time where they would have a, a pagan festival to do with. Uh, to do with what's the word I'm looking for? To do with rebirth, the, kind of thing. Oh yeah, um, fertility. Yeah. Hence the bunnies. The bunnies, they are example of a bunny, a new baby, and the eggs laying on egg. It was all to do with some kind of celebration to the praying to the god of fertility. Hence why they'd have the little, the little bunnies and the little eggs. But we're going to have to go for a brother Muhammad Tim. Before the break, we, we, we were talking about obviously the concept of God in Islam and how that struck yourself and how it struck me. But you, you basically said this is where, you know, it struck you in the, the RE, the religious education classes. And that's the beginning, you could say. But you didn't, like you said, you didn't just jump and become a Muslim, but this is where it started for you. I think that's, it's, it was a process of, of and I'm going to guess about between six and ten weeks approximately, of me going to classes and in the beginning I'm hearing about Islam and just thinking wow you know just proves that there are people elsewhere in the world who know things we don't and that suited what I believed I believed like look you know I was never a person to be particular I was I was never in favor of sort of racism and and not even patriotism I wasn't a very patriotic person like I, I didn't believe that everything good was in Britain or that every good idea was was uh, you know like started off in the UK or something like that I was a person who's like okay wow that just shows that there are people elsewhere in the world who got something right I didn't say this is a proof it's from God or anything like that I just wasn't thinking like that but over time weeks went by and I start thinking it again and again and again and again and then it got to the point where I would preempt it where I would go into class and think you know what it is whenever I hear about Islam that's the one that's gonna be right that's the one that's going to make sense. And then by the time it had got to sort of a few weeks after that, it got to the point where I started to think something is really seriously happening here. Because every time I hear something about Islam, and we covered things like prayer, we covered even things like punishments, uh, the system of punishments and things like that. Like it just everything I heard about Islam, it made so much sense. Um, and. I think sadly the biggest problem is that we as Muslims don't implement or many of us don't implement Islam as it should be implemented uh, and people have a false impression of Islam by what Muslims do and my teacher tried to reinforce that so I remember her when we talked about prayer I remember her saying how many of you pray five times a day in a class of 14 year old kids and you know there's three Muslims in the class or four Muslims in the class nobody puts their hand up so then she says okay four times a day nobody puts their hand up or one person puts their hand up you know, three times a day one person puts their hand up it, for me that didn't ever affect me that didn't ever make me think but it does for a lot of people a lot of people say but you know look at the terrible things that are happening in Muslim countries but that's not representative of Islam Islam is what the Quran says what the Prophet peace be upon him said um, you know it's it's it, it's it's not somebody's culture it's not somebody's country you know it's bigger than that and a lot of people do that I remember even some of my family members they would say to me you know like you know oh we you know the Muslims you know the guy he walks in front and the woman she walks halfway down the street mm -hmm. basing it upon some subcontinent cultural practice or you know all their ideas of Muslims were certain cultural Muslims who were actually doing things that were in their culture that were also done by maybe subcontinent Hindus, subcontinent Sikhs, subcontinent Christians, but they think that, that, that those negative things that, you know, therefore become Islam. Yeah, absolutely. So that didn't really affect me, but I, like that, I imagine that would affect a lot of people and the teacher really tried to push that, like, look, you know, Islam, you might think Islam sounds great, but it, Islam can't, it's not practical. You can't live a life as a Muslim. And I actually disagreed. I, when I listened to that, I was like, you know, you can't. This is, this is something that is so simple. But I still believed that I would find a fault. I still believed that even though I was preempting it and even though I loved, I was, at that point, I was, I was into Islam. I was hooked on it. I still believed I would find a flaw. I, I still ultimately believed Islam would just turn out to be this better than Christianity, but not like 100% perfect. It would just be better. 
and that's why I started researching. I went home, I opened whatever existed of the internet at that time. I don't think it was Google, I think it was maybe Alta Vista or something like, like mm -hmm. that. You know, Probably. Like something something in the, on those lines and it's long, long forgotten. And subhanAllah, I remember just looking through uh, stuff about Islam. Of course, I didn't find accurate information. I found a hodgepodge of different beliefs, different groups telling different things. But I found enough to make me convinced that there wasn't that flaw. That flaw just didn't exist. It wasn't anything wrong with Islam. And that moved me into the phase of, okay, if there's nothing wrong with Islam and there's no flaw, it must be from God. And if it's from God, I should become a Muslim. But I didn't want to become a Muslim at 14. Because I was 14, peer pressure, I've just escaped peer pressure, I've just escaped all of these problems that everyone that I've been having, I've just uh, trying to run away from, you know, being associated with a particular group. The last thing I want to do is come out and say that I'm a Muslim. So I had this idea I would delay it until I was about 18 years old. Um, I tried that, I can't remember how long I tried it for, I tried it for a while. But it's one of the most horrible things you can ever do is try to be someone else. So you're someone on the inside and someone else on the outside and it was, was really, it was really painful. So ultimately I, uh, I couldn't do it and I remember lying awake one night just you know, looking out of the window, you know, just looking out the, the, the sky at night just thinking, I can't do this. I can't pretend, I can't be a Muslim in my heart and not be a Muslim on the outside. And I can't be sure that I'm going to live long enough to uh, to become Muslim at 18. So I think the time is now. And again, at no point did I have anyone give me what we would call da'wah. At no point did anyone come and say to me, become Muslim or would you like some literature about Islam? I knew some Muslim friends by that time. I had some friends who were Muslims. They probably themselves would have said they weren't the best example of Islam but they were Muslims and, and definitely they had some influence on me but they, no, none of them ever asked me to become Muslim or ever told me anything about Islam uh, I, remem I remember like, like, like yourself because obviously I also became Muslim when I was 14 but there were a few Muslim guys who didn't actually pray five times a day but they would now and again pray Jummah and it was, that's the first real introduction when I saw them bowing down and praying that made me go to my grandfather's book. And the same thing, I mean, none of them actually gave me doubt. And when I approached them, some of them were like, how can you be a Muslim? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like, no, I'm interested, seriously. And I mean, I remember that one guy actually made an effort. It's not really dawah, but it's something that gave me some kind of motivation or uh, my first kind of prayer. He wrote on a piece of paper, La ilaha illallah, there is no true God worthy worship of Allah. Subhanallah, glory be to Allah, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, and Astaghfirullah. I said, oh Allah, I seek your forgiveness. And then he said to me, you're a non-Muslim, so the last one, you've got to read it a lot. Mm. So I actually took that as well, that's the funny thing. So I was actually reading, I was walking around on the, on the way home from school by myself, saying, La ilaha illallah, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah. Because I'd already read in my grandfather's book, and the whole concept of God had made complete sense. And then... And I actually said to them, I think, you know, I want to become Muslim. They were like, oh, you, know, you can't just become Muslim. And, you know, like you said, they didn't really have any of this dawah knowledge or they didn't know what they're supposed to do apart from that paper. And they, so their idea was just keep making dhikr, keep saying subhanAllah, especially astaghfirullah, for maybe keep on, God knows, maybe one of them would have said to me, do it for years, I don't know. But for days and days, I was walking around, even some of my non-Muslim friends were like, what the, you know, what are you reading? Mm. I remember going to play tennis with one of my friends called Chris and he was like, what's that? That's some kind of Muslim prayer? I was like, yeah. He said, are you crazy? I said, no, I think, you know, I like this, you know. And I remember walking around reading it. Until the end, I actually went there and said to the guy, look, I, I want to become Muslim. Mm -hmm. And there was one guy who had a bit of knowledge, he had a bit, of, bit, 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 of, bit involved in some Islamic activities. So he basically sat me down and said, repeat after me. And they, they, I remember doing it in school and then later on going doing, going, doing it in the mosque. So that brings me to how that happened for me, some, some parallels definitely there. Uh, I relied on the internet and of course when you rely on the internet that means that you get a lot of misinformation. Uh, and I got, I, I, I got the bit of what to say, I, I figured out that I have to say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. But I was told you have to have two witnesses and that's not true. 
uh, because you know, and as soon as you hear that, you instantly think that doesn't make any sense. You know, some guy is 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 on top of a mountain, uh, you know, hanging off the edge of a cliff, and he decides finally that you know time has become to become Muslim. Well, if he doesn't find two witnesses, he may as well just let go because he's not, you know, he can't become Muslim. That doesn't make any sense at all. So. I, I didn't realize that, so I looked for two witnesses, but of course I didn't want to tell anybody, I didn't want to tell my Muslim friends that I was going to become Muslim, so I figured I would tell my mom and dad. I didn't realize you had to have, they had to be Muslim or anything, they just <laughs> said you have to find two witnesses, you know. Go down the local fish and chip shop. Yeah, I, I think Can I, you witnesses? I, uh, I, I told my mom and dad, but I didn't tell them I'd become Muslim, I just said, mom, dad, I want to read you something, uh, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Shadow Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And then uh, I said, to, my mom said, What's that? And I said, Something in Arabic. It's just that uh, w some words I found, you know, like on the internet. <laughs> and then I left. Um, and it, it, the first person I told was after quite a while, I think two weeks of reading on the internet, still of being a Muslim but not telling anyone. The first person I told, probably a week to two weeks, was, was one Muslim friend. And I remember sitting in his living room and saying to him that, I've got something to tell you. It's like, yeah, what's up? I said, I've become a Muslim. And he just took it completely in his stride. He didn't even blink. He was like, oh, that's good. You've saved yourself from Jahannam. Do you know, like, next topic. You know, like, it was like, and then after a while, it kind of struck him. And then he told his family. And then they told a lot of other families. And there's a big sort of, you know, kind of, uh, everyone's very happy. Everyone wanted to talk to me. And everyone wanted to offer advice. And that is sometimes not the best recipe for success. Uh, that led me to a lot of problems as my, in my practicing of Islam in the beginning because everybody with every different belief and every different sort of group and every different party wanted to give me advice about Islam and that caused me a lot of difficulties but the, the biggest obstacle I had after that was telling my parents. Um, in the end my mom guessed it. She actually said to me, have you become a Muslim? I said, mom don't be ridiculous. So, Muslim, you're crazy. You know, I'm become a Muslim. And then, uh, after some days later, after that incident, I said to her that mom, I became a Muslim. And I, I've never asked my mom how she knew. I, I don't know why I haven't asked. And every time I give this lecture, I say that, those same words. And every time I give it, I make a mental note and think, next time I see my mom, I must ask her how she ever. But I've never asked her how she knew. Maybe she saw me praying, maybe she saw me reading on the internet or something like that. But she had figured it out. I told her. She sat me down. She said, why? Um, at that time, Islam didn't have the, the, the negative reputation as much as it, as it, does, as it does in the West today. Yeah. Um, but still, there were some elements of that. There were some incidents and some things that had happened, people doing crazy things in the name of Islam that had definitely you know, put somewhat of a strange name you know, or association with Islam. But the thing is, my, my mom always is, uh, she, she's, she's the one who makes the decisions in the house. My dad is very much just does what my mom said. And I remember her turning to him for support and saying, you know, Peter, I, 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 what are you going to do? You know, like your son's just become Muslim. And he went, well, he seems to be, you know, quite convinced. And she said, you know, how, you know, how can you say this? He's just changed his religion. In the end, we all agreed that there would be no discussion of Islam, but I could be a Muslim as long as I didn't give them any doubt. As long as I never tried to preach to them about Islam, I could be, I could be a Muslim. I could, I could basically, privately and, and in a very sort of secular, sort of hidden way, be a Muslim. But as long as I didn't share it in the house, because my mom didn't want it to go back to what it was like when her father was a Jehovah's Witness. She didn't want it to become like preaching and don't do this and this is not allowed. So she said, look, you do what you want, but on the condition, on the condition that you don't talk to us about it, you don't preach to us, you leave us with our religion, you have yours. And she pushed me very strongly, and it was quite a good idea really, not to tell too many people about it. Because she said, look, you don't know whether you're going to keep your religion, you don't know whether you're going to stay as a Muslim, it might just be a phase you're going through. So don't tell the world and then make problems for yourself. And that actually might be the wrong reason but it's actually the right advice and the wrong reason the reasoning was wrong but the advice was probably right is that when someone becomes a Muslim it's not a bad idea for them to be a little bit you know be a little bit 
sort of restricted in, in how many people they tell in the beginning while they get a handle on Islam themselves. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't, themselves. Yeah, it doesn't work for everyone. Some people are able to just shout it out from the rooftops. But a lot of people, including a lot of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, didn't announce their Islam immediately. They took some time to just get used to it in themselves, learn, and then start to slowly tell more and more people that they had become, they had become Muslim. Now we've got about five or six minutes left of this episode. Now, what would you advise people out there who may be looking uh, into Islam, are curious, the, the ones who are curious, the ones who uh, feel that Islam is the right way but are hesitant. What would you advise both kind of people in these last five minutes? I think one of the most important things is to get authentic knowledge about what Islam really is. Because actually if you read Islam uh, with auth from authentic sources, without culture, without weird ideas and weird sort of implementations of Islam, and you get the pure Islam as it was taught by the Prophet peace be upon him, as was practiced by his companions, then that's all you need to understand the truth of Islam. The biggest problem we have is that the message is not delivered in a, in a pure and true way. Instead what happens is the message is distorted through cultural practices, through strange beliefs and different groups and ideologies and each one of them has their own agenda to put forward and they use Islam for that. And so a very twisted, very substandard version of Islam is, is what people end up taking. So what I would say is the importance of really going back to genuine, authentic, reliable information about Islam. I think if a person does that, they will be, they, they need nothing else because Islam is, is so convincing and so beautiful and so perfect and so suitable for the time that we live in uh, and suitable for every time and every place. Uh, it, 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 does, it, it sells itself. You don't need someone to sell it. But you just need to make sure that they get the real message of Islam. So I would say even be very picky where you get your knowledge about Islam from. Be really careful to get reliable, authentic, genuine knowledge. Um, to go back to the original sources, the Quran, um, the Sunnah, the guidance of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And I think when you do that, you get, you get a genuine message of what Islam really is. And that's more than enough for people, uh, whether they are people who are non-Muslims who are looking into Islam, or whether they're Muslims who've just strayed away from the path a little bit and are a bit confused because you, know, you might have been given a very cultural understanding of Islam uh, as a child and, and grown up to think well Islam's not really all that great but actually if you, re if you learn the real Islam and the true Islam you would value it for what it really is and, and that's I think that would be my, my most important piece of advice. I mean that's also important what you mentioned not even not just for the non-Muslims but even like you said Muslims who feel like they're a bit disheartened or a bit confused is so many of the practices that they have been brought up with and or non-Muslims have seen Muslims doing in their daily life a lot of the time aren't actually proper Islamic teachings and they can resemble many of the practices resemble other religions or are just completely cultural just like in every culture there is a uh, every all cultures there are some bad elements I mean no one can say my no 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 my you know even British culture there is some negative some negative things we have a very big pub culture which then leads on to uh, which is can associate to football hooligans no one can say that the football hooligans are a good part of British culture that we should be proud of so likewise there are many Muslim you know uh, nations which have Muslims but they will have some culture that you know, will not be in Islam and many of the people in the West have seen certain cultural practices which they think, you know, oh look at those Muslims and, and I, I recently read something actually even about child marriage and we, of, we often, it's a bit of a topic and we've only got a little, a little left of the show but um, I read an article that you often hear how Muslims child marriage, child marriage, I'm talking about really young children and we know, you know, uh, which even, you know, Islamically is not allowed um, they literally f said that 88.8% of young, young child marriages in the world were actually uh, happened to be in India from the Hindu religion, 
but if you'd have me and you, I mean, got like 15 seconds left, but we would obviously think that that has to be Muslims, the way it's always portrayed out there in public. So that's so many things are like that, and that's not the real facts. And we could go on forever on this. Jazakallah for coming on the show. Uh, we'll have you, inshallah, on some future episodes. I hope so. And uh, thank you again, viewers, for joining us. And inshallah, same time, same place next week. Live by Islam, which we all try and do, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Wa